Michael. How are you? I'm good, Sonia. How are you? I'm good. We are live. <laughs> okay. We had some technical difficulties getting started today, so we are finally ready. We had to delay by a couple of minutes. Um, I'm going to start just by, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of The Healthy Menu brought to you by Menusano. I'm your host, Sonia. Uh, today, I'm hosting the Healthy Menu Live to support the Devour Food Festival. The festival is a transformative food and film experience combining cinematic excellence with extraordinary activities. The annual week-long festival, the largest food festival in the world, typically hosts 100 plus events celebrated uh, filmmakers and high-profile chefs from around the globe. Devour welcomes close to 15,000 food and film lovers to Wolfville, Nova Scotia, Canada. The festival returns to its 12th edition. This year, the theme is the future of food. Uh, it centers around the increasing interest in plant-based nutrition and cuisine, sustainability, sustainable fishing, farming, and a look at new food choices that continue to emerge throughout the world. Our guest today is Michael Howell. Welcome, Michael. Uh, and Michael has a long list of uh, Michael, I think there's a little delay between us, so we'll try to work through that. I'm just going to give a quick introduction on Michael. He has a long list of things that he's done, things he's involved in. So um, I'll just get to that. Uh, Michael is the founder and executive director of Devour and consultant for uh, chef at the Green Turtle Club in Abaco, Bahamas. For more than 25 years, Michael has been a leading chef across the United States, Canada, uh, and the Bahamas. From 2003 to 2013, Michael owned and operated Tempest, an award-winning restaurant in, in Wolfville, um, uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, Michael has twice cooked uh, at New York's pre prestigious James Beard House. His cookbook, Atlantic Food uh, seafood was runner up at the 2010 Taste Canada Awards that was recently released in an updated second edition. Michael is the former co chair of Slow Food Canada and was honored by Queen Elizabeth II with the Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2011 for his contributions in improving the food system for all. He was Nova Scotia's local food hero in 2010 and named Taste of Nova Scotia's. Nova Scotia's Culinary Ambassador in 2015. The Vower was awarded the 2017 Canadian Treasures Award for Innovation in Hospitality by the George Brown Center of Culinary Arts in, in 2018. Uh, he was awarded the Tourism Industry Association of Nova Scotia Culinary Ambassador Award. That's a lot. <laughs> Any Anything that I missed, Michael? <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, thank you for reading out every single accolade that I've ever received. But I tried, I tried. <laughs> all good. So, you know, I've sort of walked through your, you know, professional accolades. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself uh, on a personal level, what you're all about? Yeah. So uh, I am uh, originally from Nova Scotia, uh, born in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, raised in Chester. Uh, but I went to theater school with the intention of becoming an actor. And in fact, I was an actor and director in the early stages of my uh, my life from 20 to 30. And I, in fact, moved to Toronto and was a member of the Shaw Festival Company for a number of seasons back in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, at the end of the 1980s, I had developed a love for being a chef. I, in fact, when I was still in high school, I was the first guy at my high school to ever take home ec in 1977 because I wanted to learn how to cook. So when circumstances took me to Chicago in 1994, I changed careers and went to culinary school. Uh, I graduated from the Cooking and Hospitality Institute of Chicago, and I spent three years at the Everest Room, a prestigious uh, Michelin two-star French restaurant in Chicago where I began my career that took me all over North America, New York, Detroit, Toronto, Minneapolis, Vancouver, eventually to New York, finally to the Bahamas in 1999, where I spent three years as the executive chef at a small hotel. And then I moved home to Nova Scotia in 2003, where, as you mentioned, I owned and operated Tempest for a decade. Um, in 2009, 
Uh, I have been a member of Slow Food for many years, uh, not just a chef, but farmers and people from all walks of life that believe it's important that we know what we put in our bodies and where it comes from. And so I adopted that mantra at my restaurant to, to make sure that farmers were being celebrated, that healthy choices were being made at my restaurant in terms of the food that I prepared and a lot of seafood. So, because uh, most of my career has been cooking uh, fish and seafood. So in 2009, I had come up with this idea that maybe we wanted to bring people to rural Nova Scotia in the off season to help booster, bolster tourism activities. So I had heard about this film festival through Slow Food. It was in Italy, it was in Bologna, Italy, and it was called Slow Food on Film. And it was a slow food film festival that was uh, devoted to showing hard hitting documentaries about the food system, what's right, what's wrong, how we're affecting our lives and our health through both healthy and unhealthy eating. So in 2009, a completely volunteer effort, we did the first edition of, of Devour. At the time, it was called the Slow Motion Food Film Festival, and we had a thousand people show up. Uh, so uh, I, two years later, we decided to do it again, but I did not know how to run a film festival. I did not know how to procure films. So I was introduced to a, my work for 20 years at the Atlantic Film Festival, and she joined me in 2011, and we mounted the second edition, and we had 2,000 people. We doubled our numbers from year one to year two. Uh, that's when we decided that maybe we were on to something. I sold my restaurant to my sous chef. Leah left her job at the Atlantic Film Festival. We changed the name to the Devour Food Film Festival, and we've been going ever since, since 2013. Uh, this is our 12th edition now, and as you mentioned, uh, in 2019, pre-pandemic, pre we attracted 15,000 people to rural Nova Scotia in late fall. We have 15 satellite events around the world, uh, at other film festivals, at other locations, and uh, we're in the process now of creating a permanent facility here in Wolfville for our festival and some other organizations. So that's where we are. Very nice. That sounds like uh, a lot of work. <laughs> oh, I think chefs are used to working pretty hard and also crazy hours. Uh, so this actually affords me a slightly more normal lifestyle. But working hard, if you're passionate about something and passionate about helping people eat better and change the food system, yeah, you have to bring passion to the game. Yeah. What made you want to sort of go down that road of healthy eating and you know, local farm to table, what, what sort of led you on that path? So, I, I, so the farm to table path uh, was inspired by Charlie Trotter, of all people in Chicago, very famous chef. And in fact, when I moved to Chicago, I actually wanted to work at his restaurant. That was my whole reason for going to culinary school. I want to work for Charlie Trotter. He's the greatest okay. chef, along with Emeril Lagasse and Norman Van Eken in Florida. So he was one of the first people in fine dining in America to put the names of, of farmers on his menus. And I thought that was great. So when I moved to Nova Scotia and eventually started my restaurant, I too had that same mantra. Let's celebrate farmers. Let's celebrate where the food comes from. I try not to buy from Cisco. No offense to Cisco. I try to buy from farmers and producers directly, taking up the middleman and ensuring freshness. So that's where it all kind of came from. Nice. So you are known as the godfather of advocacy in the culinary world. What was the spark that got you started down that path? Yeah, it was definitely my uh, engagement with slow food and understanding that world health can be very much influenced by food choices that we make. Mm -hmm. Food calls it, we're not, we're not uh, consumers, we're co-producers. By making choices, we affect production. And in fact, if you choose to eat an apple or not eat an apple, you're affecting food supply. So I love that idea behind being a co-producer that by simply consuming and making proper choices, whether as a, as a person that's simply eating or me as a chef feeding hundreds of other people on a daily, daily basis, that those choices could make a difference in, in terms of what we can do. Then the idea of how do we expand that degree of knowledge? Uh, it's, it's one thing to have people come to your restaurant, but how do you get the word out to more people? And that's when the idea of this film festival came along. Everybody loves film. Everybody loves mm -hmm. it. Fun. Whether it's at home on Netflix or still going to the big screen, we love watching movies, and it's a great way to get messages across. I was very 
very much influenced by the seminal film Food, Inc. by the director Robert Kenner. And I like that, that one. Wonderful. And in fact, it was one of the first films we ever showed. So that was when I realized, and Leah too, we can change minds and change lives through film and food. Thus the kernel of the festival and my advocacy. So how is it uh, as a chef to um, create recipes with just local products? So, you know, we all know that things like avocados don't grow in Canada and there's certain things that get imported. Um, so if you're doing um, farm to table, are you limited or are you creating recipes based on the ingredients that you have access to in the seasons that they're available? So you, you've hit upon a central tenet to challenge the local food movement in one way. Mm -hmm. uh, there are camps only cook seasonally with what's available in your region. It's, it's sort of an extremist version of, of local food movement. I, I ascribe to a somewhat more lenient uh, uh, ethos in that regard. If you have product that is local and in seasonal, use that first. Don't buy apples from New Zealand if you have apples from Nova Scotia. But I still love a cup of coffee, and if we can't have coffee grown in Nova Scotia, we should at least be sourcing it ethically uh, as much as we possibly can. Oranges are good. For us, but I'll never have Scotia. So a healthy balance between buying what's available in season and selling, but a full and rounded diet of, of complex foods from all food groups is essential. And so avocados can be good for you. So I would never poo-poo or eschew using an avocado, but if there was a locally grown avocado, I would certainly buy that one first. Very nice. Um, so tell us about Wholesome Crave and Wholesome Wave. So um, I have been uh, very much uh, in the chef game for about 27 years now. And I used to watch this show called Great Chefs of America way back when I was starting my career. And, and Emeril Lagasse, of course, was on that and, and other guests that people would have heard of. But there was a guy, uh, he, his name was Michel Nishan, and he was one of the first people in America to sort of move away from meat as central to the plate. COP, center of the plate, is what we refer to as the main protein when you're cooking in a restaurant environment. So Michel Nishan was one of the first people to be doing that in America and opened vegetarian restaurants. He opened a very famous one called Hearth Restaurant way back when. And I became enamored of the fellow and, and he uh, advocated for plant-based eating in restaurants. So I've been following him for years. Then it seemed I went on and moved to the Bahamas and life got in the way. And then this year, when we hit upon our theme of the future of food, plant forward cuisine and cinema, his name popped right into my head. Also, circuitously, he's a very good friend of Jacques Pepin, and many of your listeners probably know that Jacques Pepin was one of the great French chefs in America, was on PBS with Julia Child for many years. He, in fact, has been to Devour uh, uh, once. We've actually cooked for him twice in the last year. I've had the honor of cooking for him. He lives in Connecticut, and one of his best friends is Michel Nishan. So that's when I rent. This is too serendipitous. So we've invited Michelle to come to Nova Scotia this year, bring products from Wholesome Crave, and then give a workshop based on his ethos of celebrating plants and being creative with plants uh, in a way that makes them interesting, diverse, and tasty. Very nice. Um, can you tell us about the SNAP program and how it contributes towards food equality and healthy food for all? The snack program? Yeah, the snap. Oh, uh, I'm afraid I don't know what that is. Okay, maybe that's the a question for that they mixed up. I'm not sure. Okay, so what's the with the pandemic uh, and rise in supply chain issues and food shortages? What do you think the future uh, looks like for global food systems? Uh, I'm I'm of two minds. So there are advocates of the. GMO movement, uh, commodity agriculture that will say we need to have large scale agriculture to feed the world. I'm a firm believer that uh, we can exist and feed ourselves on smaller scale agriculture, aquaculture and, uh, and terraculture. Uh, vertical farming has the opportunity to grow food uh, in ways that are much more productive than commercial agriculture currently does. So mm -hmm. I 
I believe that we're in a dangerous place right now when it comes to uh, relying on large-scale food production. And, and, and it's the idealist in me, the slow food idealist, that uh, has sort of kept me busy with my idea that eating small, eating more locally, uh, not relying on, on uh, large-scale production wherever possible and buying from local farmers will help us uh, survive this period. If more people knew how to grow, grow food, like if more of us grew food, more of us would eat more vegetables and eat better. So that's what I'm hoping for. Great. You've been in the culinary industry for more than 25 years. Tell us about uh, things that you've learned throughout your culinary career. Uh, yeah, I've cooked a lot of fish, uh, like I really okay. have. Uh, and, and in fact, my current job in the Bahamas, where I was permanently in 99 till 2002, and now I'm there frequently, the idea that I can actually catch the fish that I serve to my customers is hyper-local. We've all heard that hyper-local movement. So I love the idea that the chef is sourcing or actually partaking in the process of food, uh, either production, consumption, or foraging, and bringing it to the table. Because then it's truly, truly authentically local. It's a lot of greenwashing. Mm -hmm. So trying to avoid greenwashing is something that we all try to do so that we're honest, honestly... Uh, being truthful about the food that we're serving to our customers. Um, the other thing probably is that uh, chefs in the restaurant business do not have lives like the rest of us. And we are always working when other people are playing. I had a bit of an epiphany when I realized that I had worked 25 New Year's Eves in a row. And I, I missed a lot of life and missed a lot of family and friends. So. A healthy balance of, of work and being uh, out there and recognizing that, that a social life is important is something that you do learn after 25 years of hiding from the real world. I, I agree. It's good to have a good work-life balance. I can't even imagine working that much. You must like really love what you do if that's the case. I think you'll find most chefs that you talk to, Sonia, do love what they do. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm also, I'm not in a restaurant day-to-day -day anymore, so the grind is not the same sort of pervasive awfulness that I might have felt uh, at 11.30 on a Saturday night after 110 mm -hmm. hours. Uh, my body has suffered. I've gotten some arthritis over the years because of my years in the kitchen. But, but ultimately, you know, it, it's a great place to learn. It's a great place to learn strength and resilience. And it's a great place to learn where and how to work hard. So it, it brings a lot of good ethic to my current position here at Devour. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice for food entrepreneurs and those in the food startup space? There was a guy, a young fellow here in Wolfville. This is a town of about 5,000 people an hour from Halifax. Acadia University is here. We have a nice little Ivy League school. And a young man came to me about six years ago and said, Mike, I'm thinking about doing uh, maybe some food delivery services. Nobody's doing food delivery. This is long before the pandemic. He just thought, well, do you think that would work here? And I was an old fuddy-duddy curmudgeon that had been in this for 25 years. And I went, that'll never work. Who's going to go for food delivery when you can go to a restaurant? Well, think outside the box is really all I can say. If you've got a good idea, don't listen to somebody that's older or jaded in the business detract you from pursuing something that may be cool. Who, who would have thought that that DoorDash would be a thing or, or that Uber Eats would be pervasive? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that, that degree of food entrepreneurship uh, is changing the way we eat and the way we think. Uh, the other thing to do is food entrepreneurs don't think that, that uh, farming is not a bad choice, right? Because you can combine lifestyle with food entrepreneurship and, and healthier choices. Mm-hmm. Um, where do you think the restaurant food industry is headed in terms of innovation and technology? So two sides of that. Obviously, the future of food is a, is a part of our festival this year. It's raining here. You may hear a little bit of rain. Um, okay. and, and that uh, plant-based cuisine and plant-based foods, they're coming. They're coming no matter what. We're going to be eating plant-based burgers and plant-based sausages and other forms of things. Uh, that are going to become part of our, our foodscape. Uh, and in fact, we're working with one of our sponsors this year and a chef, uh, Doug McNish, is coming down here to cook with algae-based proteins that are derived from algae. Uh, a couple of years ago, we served up some cricket powder uh, in, a, in, a, in a cup to some students that were attending a festival. 
and we have to come to grips with uh, the alternatives uh, that are uh, out there in the protein universe. We need to be thinking way, way outside the box. Uh, only North America uh, is uh, stuck in this idea of, of meat, fish, and, uh, and poultry. So we got to be thinking about other things to put in the middle of the plate. It's funny. I was at an event uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was around manufacturing in Canada and Sweden. And one of the uh, keynote speakers was actually a director of a factory in Sweden. And what they do is produce, produce that kind of protein, um, yeah. crickets. And, and I was just like, I was amazed to see the, first of all, the, the size of this facility and um, their, their focus is sort of on animal protein to start. Uh, but their goal is long term to have uh, access to creating products out of these crickets for, for human consumption. Crickets and insects offer a great alternative for the future, much healthier, much more nutritious. Uh, it's just we have a stigma attached to them, right? We yeah. don't see a cow being butchered and turned into steak, but you kind of, you can visualize a cricket being mushed up and turned into cricket powder. I know maybe we're getting off topic here, but <laughs> insects and algae uh, and, and alternative food sources, seaweeds are definitely part of the future. Right, right. So what's your favorite dish to cook? I, I'm going to say, you're going to say fish, but let me see if I'm <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to say pizza. Uh, I'm a, I'm a pizza. English, Irish, Scottish, and Italian guy. Look at me. I'm a ginger that's going gray. But I, I actually, <laughs> I, I heard I'm, a, I'm a diehard Italian at heart. In fact, for 10 years, both my slow food connections, which is based in Italy, but I've also been an Italian tour guide for 10 years. I, in fact, just got back from the Amalfi Coast last Monday night after hosting a tour of Naples and the Amalfi Coast. And I'm a pizza geek. I love messing with pizza hot doughs and hydrations and uh, simple ingredients. So, yeah, I like making pizza. Wow. I thought you were going to say fish. I totally <laughs> got that wrong. <laughs> Cooked some halibut two nights ago quite deliciously. But my go-to for a fun... Let's have some fun evening, you know, Mike, a uh, glass of red wine, uh, I'll make a pizza. You know, I'll start it 48 hours ahead. I've got to make my poolish and then let it rise for 24 hours, et cetera, et cetera. And then recently uh, a friend gave me the Modernist Pizza series uh, of books from Nathan Mirvold. So I can't wait to dig into those and get real geeky about pizza dough. So what's some of your favorite pizza to toppings? Oh, uh, favorite one by far, it's, it's a white pizza. That might have a little bit of gorgonzola, fig, and prosciutto's on it. Prosciutto on it, so so no tomato sauce. Uh, maybe some oh. pear thrown on as well too. So there's that sweet, sour, salty, and bitter all in one pizza. I've never had a pizza with figs on it. Fig, fig and prosciutto is very common in some parts of Italy. Uh, sometimes they'll throw arugula on it, but they more commonly, uh, you know, the prosciutto is salty. So is a bit of gorgonzola. But the figs are sweet, and then, you know, the pears offer uh, uh, a different sort of form of sweetness and, and uh, texture, I guess. Very nice. Uh, what's next for you and the Devour Fest? So uh, we will be announcing next year's theme at this year's festival. Uh, we've often dealt with things like... Um, you know, ethnicity. So we taste, we did Chicago, the cuisine of Chicago once a couple of years ago, we did the food and films of Italy. So we will be going to a geographic uh, uh, theme next year, but the festival itself um, will be making a fairly large public announcement sometime next week uh, about a permanent home for our facility. We're only a week long festival, but we want to be able to go year round. And so uh, patrons are affording us the opportunity to create a facility which will allow us to operate our festival year round and expand our educational opportunities with kids uh, to uh, grow our opportunity to teach people from minority cultures, both how to cook, but also how to make movies as well. Uh, we're a film festival, Sonia, first. That's just our mm -hmm. theme is food. So teaching people how to make movies and television is also a part of our mantra. So we're hoping that this facility, which we'll announce in a week or two, uh, will be uh, an opportunity for us to grow and become much more active within the foodscape, but also the film sphere. Okay, we have a question 
from uh, someone watching. The question is from John. Do you have any advice for anyone seeking a career in the industry? So, it, yes, I do, uh, of course. And it's probably what an awful lot of people are going to say. Uh, don't go into it in the first place because it's hard and difficult. But, but, but the reality is an awful lot of people think that success in the food industry comes very quickly. Uh, and that kids graduating from culinary school these days are expecting to be running restaurants within a year or two. And the, re the sad reality is you do not have enough experience. A chef is a person who runs a restaurant, not a person who cooks. A cook is a person who cooks. So for, in that regard, you have to allow yourself time to learn from peers, to learn from trends, and to learn from customers what it is that you need to be doing in a restaurant. So all I can say is give yourself time. Don't think you're going to run a restaurant or be on the Food Network in two years. Give yourself five to ten. Uh, start early. I didn't go to culinary school till I was 30. You know, I became a chef when I was 35, so about five years after I went to school. Don't rush it. Give yourself time to learn from those that you respect and try and work with people who have great reputations for being educators and not just famous people. Mm-hmm. That's great advice. Um, so we're almost running out of time, but I do have one last question for you. Uh, for those attending uh, the festival this year, what are some of the things that they can expect? So we have a wonderful uh, diversity of experiences. Obviously, we show film, 53 films, uh, some shorts, uh, 23 feature length films. We have culinary workshops. We have bourbon tasting workshops. We have vegan cooking workshops. We have, as I mentioned, you know, cooking with algae-based protein workshops. We also have fun community events like our Chowder Smackdown where local restaurants get together. And I think we have eight or nine different restaurants competing for the title of Chowder Champion. Uh, and then we have wonderful uh, experiential activities. Uh, there's a foraging workshop where you go foraging with a, a, a chef and then while you're out foraging for ingredients, and yes, you can still find some here in Nova Scotia in October, you'll be cooking that and eating it while you're out foraging. And then there are wonderful things like the mayor's bike ride. And of course, lots of fun things that would typically be associated with a film festival, parties, movie stars, lots of great chefs from across America and Canada will be here. So a wonderful convivial atmosphere with lots of music this year. But our workshops are some of the fun stuff. I mean, Michael Nishan, who we talked about before, is giving a workshop on creating vegan soups. Jason Bangerter from Langdon Hall in Ontario is giving an amazing workshop on, on uh, cooking with plants as well. Uh, so it's really, there's a little bit of something for everybody. There's even free events. We do a, an event on our final day. We encourage people, we give away a thousand free chicken dinners and this year also Impossible Burgers uh, to clients of food banks uh, who otherwise may not be able to have a meal so we give it away completely free and all of our chefs participate by preparing this barbecued chicken dinner and giving it to people in need so giving back is always what devour is about as well oh very nice and when does the uh festival start and how long does it go on for our student program starts monday with uh two films each day and then a kids cooking class uh, hands-on cooking classes Monday, Tuesday. We officially open next Wednesday, October 26th, uh, with the film uh, Sorry We're Closed, a wonderful brand new film. This is the Eastern Canadian premiere of a film made by Elizabeth Faulkner and Pete Ferrero about how restaurants dealt with the COVID crisis. And so it's very timely and impactful. And that's our opening night gala next Wednesday, October 26th, here in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Very nice. Well, Michael, thank you so much for, for having us on and telling us about this wonderful festival, a little bit about yourself. It was wonderful to meet you and best of luck with the festival. And hopefully one day I'll get to try your famous pizza with fix. <laughs> meet you and chat with you today. Thank you very much for the opportunity.